how do you balance your life? I mean, with this stress, with so many different, you know, you're in so many different company, but how do you balance it? Well, I, I mean, I, I should point out that I, a 20 hour work day is uh, relatively unusual and, and rather painful, but I, I, I do sleep six hours a night. So, and if I sleep less than six hours a night, I find that I am, I might be awake longer, but I get less done. I'm not suggesting this is good for everyone. And I think, frankly, I would like to work a bit less than that. Tilda went through some very difficult times where it was on the ragged edge of survival. And if I didn't give it everything I got, I think the company could have easily gone bankrupt. It was really on the verge of bankruptcy for quite a while. I don't mean to suggest complacency at this point, but uh, you know, it, it does require much less work to operate Tesla now versus, say, in the 2017 to 2019 timeframe. Twitter is, is still somewhat of a startup in reverse, and so there's a lot of work required here to get Twitter to a sort of a stable position and, uh, like I said, to really uh, build the engine of engineering, of software engineering at, at Twitter and have it, um, you know, really have, a, a, like I said, a, a great product roadmap and, and the, the people in place to implement that product ro roadmap. And so it, it is not my intention to work like crazy. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because as a young entrepreneur, I struggled to keep my business going. I had no friends, I had no mentors, I had no role models. And the thing that saved me was learning from the success stories of famous entrepreneurs. And in their stories, I got motivation, and I also got strategies for what I could do to grow my business and not stay stuck. And I still need their stories for motivation today. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Elon Musk, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is fight for freedom of speech. What I think is, is, is essentially in order for civilization to advance, uh, we've got to have um, freedom of speech. We've got to have a digital, yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's a bigger deal than you'd think. Um, and it's the kind of thing that you don't know what you're missing until you don't have it. And in a lot of places, people don't have it. And um, so it's important to bear in mind that the nature of free speech is, the, the, the acid test for it is, are people you don't like allowed to say things that you don't like? Otherwise, it's not free. It can't, you, can't, it can't be just the things that, it can't be just things that you like because eventually, Somebody's not going to like what you say, and they're going to shut you up. And that's the, that's the essence of free speech, and that's why it's the First Amendment in this country. And if we lose that, I think we lose the bedrock of democracy. Rule number three is promote AI safety. AI is um, perhaps uh, more dangerous than, say, mismanaged uh, aircraft design or production maintenance or, or, or b bad car production uh, in the sense that it is, it has the potential, uh, however small one may regard that probability, but it is non-trivial. It has the potential of civilizational destruction. <laughs> There's movies like Terminator, but I, it wouldn't quite happen like Terminator um, because the, the intelligence would be in the data centers. Right. Uh, the robot's just the end effector. But I think perhaps uh, what you may be alluding to here is that um, regulations are really only put into effect after something terrible has happened. That's correct. If that's the case for AI and we're only putting regulations after something terrible has happened, it may be too late to actually put the regulations in place. The AI may be in control at that point. You think that's real. It is, it is conceivable that AI could take control and reach a point where you couldn't turn it off and it would be making, making the decisions for people. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's, that's, the, that's definitely the, where things are headed, uh, for sure. Uh, uh, I mean, um, the, the, the things like, like say, uh, ChatGPT, which is uh, based on GPT-4 from OpenAI, which right. is a company that I uh, played a, a, a critical role in, in creating, unfortunately. Uh, Back when it was a nonprofit? <sighs> yes. Um, I mean, the, 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 the reason uh, OpenAI exists at all is that um, Larry Page and I used to be close friends, and I would yes. stay at his house in Palo Alto, and I would talk to him late into the night about uh, AI safety. And at least my perception was that Larry was not taking uh, AI safety uh, seriously enough. Um, and um, What did he say about it? He really seemed to be... Um, Wanted, wanted, wanted sort of 
a digital super intelligence, basically digital god, if you will, uh, uh, as soon as possible. Um, he wanted that. Yes, he's, he's made many public statements over the years. Uh, that that the whole goal of Google is uh, uh, what's called AGI, artificial general intelligence, or artificial super intelligence. You know, and I, and I agree with him that the, there's great potential for good, um, but there's also potential for bad. And so, if if you've got some um, radical new technology, you want to try to take the set of actions that maximize probably it, it will do good, and minimize probably it will do bad things. Yes. Um, it, it can't just be health leather. Let's just go, you know, barreling forward and you know hope for the best. Rule number four is maximize the use of technology. How do you see technology in the next 10 years from now? Well, see, 10 years, it's always difficult to predict technology with precision, um, especially over a 10-year time frame when it is changing so much. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's obviously the transition to sustainable energy uh, with uh, solar, wind, batteries, and electric vehicles. Um, and and that, that is, if you look at the percentage growth of that, that is a very high percentage growth. Um, although because of the massive industrial base of, um, of, of the current sort of um, fossil fuel economy, it, it, even, like, even if all, for example, if, if electric cars were 100% of production immediately, it would take 20 years to replace the fleet. So this is still something that is quite gradual. You know, it's, it's measured in at least a few, you know, 30, 30 40 years type, type of time frame. The chat GPT, I think, has illustrated to uh, people just how advanced AI has become. Um, the, the, because the AI has been advanced for a while, it just didn't have a user interface that was um, accessible to most people. Um, so what really ChatGPT has done is just put an, an accessible user interface on AI technology that is um, has been present for a few years. Um, and there are much more advanced versions for that that are coming out. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business i'll see you there rule number five is innovate elon um a question on applying first principles thinking and innovation to an area that up to now has seemingly been outside of of your control and that is on mining and extraction of some of the key materials I believe a couple years ago you, you had a patent on sodium chloride uh, to extract lithium from some, from some clays and spodumene clay and, and things of that nature. Um, any, how, how does that fit into the plan of maybe bringing real innovation into a mining sector that could use a little, you know, maybe waking up and getting those costs down? Because that could be a real gating factor, it seems. Well, we're, we're, we're going to address whatever we think the limiting factor is at any point in time. Uh, so we'd, we would like to do the least amount possible. Uh, so we, we don't want to get into the mining or refining sector. We will do that if we have to. Um, I, I do think the, the, the focus really should be on refining capacity. Um, you know, do you, we need to make just a, a very uh, giant amount of anode, cathode, lithium, lithium hydroxide, lithium, lithium carbonate. It, it, it's really the refining capacity that is uh, the, the, the biggest choke point. Um, yeah, so that's, that's why we're building a lithium refinery in Corpus Christi. And we're, we're obviously building a uh, cathode processing uh, facility just adjacent to this, this building. So a little further down the road, you'll see another large construction. That's for uh, cathode refining. Um, but we, like I said, we'd really prefer if others did that. Uh, we're, we're doing it because we have to, not because we want to. Rule number six is create transparency. I think in order to really build trust, you have to have transparency. You, it can't be that here's this black box, something's happening in here, we won't tell you what it is, 
trust us, I think that's BS. Um, if you want to trust something, you've got to know how it works. And so the, that, that's why we're open sourcing the algorithm. Now, open sourcing the algorithm is kind of embarrassing. People have found all sorts of things that were wrong um, and foolish and you know, misguided with, with the algorithm. And we've actually fixed, I think at this point, over 100 issues with the algorithm. Um, so it's, been, it's actually been very helpful uh, to open source it. Um, and we're going to open source the entire thing. The, uh, you sh basically, you should be able to recreate the probability of, of a tweet being recommended based on, on, the, on what we've open sourced. If you can't recreate it, then we haven't shown you everything. So it's, it's really complete transparency, and that, I think that's the only path to trust. I don't think there's another path. Rule number seven is read more and talk to smart people. I know you're a huge reader, um, but from a, um, a lifelong learning perspective, constantly trying to add to your toolkit so that you're you know, a better leader, a better CEO, are there recommendations that you have for the audience about those kinds of things that you do to keep yourself mentally sharp? Well, I read a lot less these days than I used to. When I was a kid, I was read all the time. Um, I mean, I mostly subscribe to scientific periodicals. Like, um, you know, like the, the daily news I find to be a lot of noise um, and just very negative. Uh, so I generally try to not read the daily news all that much. Because um, generally newspapers try to, seem to be trying to answer the question, what is the worst thing that happened on Earth today? Uh, <laughs> it was big, okay. There's a lot of people. Something terrible happened every single day, guaranteed. It was just a big, big plan. Also, something great happened, but they don't answer that question. Um, so that's, the daily news just tends to make one miserable. But I think like the, um, Science and tech, technology periodicals are quite uh, interesting, um, and usually, you know, if, they, if there's something, some new discovery, it'll be in, in there. Um, so, and you know, I find Twitter enlightening at times. You know, uh, you learn learn a bit there, um, and, and the talking to smart people uh, all the time uh, is very helpful. Um, because that, that can be a distillation of, of, of interesting things that are going on. Um, and, and, you know, certainly, like, try to ask people, like, for the car, like, what are we doing wrong? You know, what can we fix? What, we, what can we make it better? And they usually just want to tell me, oh, it's great, you know, I love it. And, like, but sure, I understand, but what's wrong with it? And, like, what can we make better? You know, this is a yeah. theory of, like, how do we be less wrong? Rule number eight is focus on affordability. What is the nearest term focus for you in terms of uh, ramping up the next gen vehicle? And how do you make sure that by lowering the price point uh, so much because the cost is going down 50%, you're not cannibalizing demand you know, for your existing vehicles? Demand for our vehicles in terms of desire to own them may as well be infinite. Uh, it's, it's indistinguishable from infinite at this point. Uh, the, so affordability is what matters. So as you make the car more affordable, uh, we will have demand go crazy, basically. Uh, the, the issue is how do we build the cars? The hard part is building the cars. I can't emphasize that enough. The hard part is building the cars and the entire supply chain that goes with the cars. Uh, this is a logistics challenge of extraordinary difficulty. Um, all the things that have to go into the car have to scale with the car while everything is doing an, an exponential ramp. And if you miss even one of those things, doesn't matter why, earthquake, flood, fire, revolution, I thought I'd heard them all. Uh, I mean, uh, any part of that supply chain gets interrupted. You're now, then you have a seizure. The hard part is building the cars by far and the supply chain that goes with it. Rule number nine is hire good people. When you hire people, or really what you're trying to, when you hire people, that just means you're convincing people to join you in, in the endeavor. Um, you should hire people uh, that are that also passionate about what you're doing. So it's not just, that they're not just there for the salary. 
um, they, they really need to care about what, what they're doing. And, and then, then they will stay during the dark times. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is think long term. How do you see Twitter if we, we say it five years down the road? What's your vision for, for this platform? I have this sort of long-term vision for something called uh, X.com from back at, way back in the day, uh, which is kind of like a, a um, sort of like an everything app um, where it's just maximally useful. It, it does, you know, payments, uh, does, um, uh, so it provides financial services, provides information flow, um, really anything digital. Um, and, um, you know, also provides secure communications. Um, so, really, to, 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 you know, I think you know, be, be as useful as possible, as entertaining as possible, um, and also to be like a, a source of, of truth. Like, if you want to uh, find out what's going on and what's really going on, um, then you could should be able to go on, on, on you know, X, the X app. And, um, and and find out. So it's a sort of source, a sort of a, a source of truth, and a maximally useful, I guess, app is about the wrong word, but system. Um, and and twi Twitter is essentially an accelerant to that sort of maximally useful everything app. How do you deal with the people who say, no, you are shooting too far ahead. You are trying to do something that's impossible. Don't bother doing it or, uh, or are resistant to change. How do you manage those, that resistance, the naysayers out there and continue on? Well, I would go back to physics in that um, the only things that are truly impossible are breaking the laws of physics. Um, so as long as you're not breaking the laws of physics, um, it's possible. It doesn't matter what anyone's opinion is. Um, you know, physics is the law and everything else is a recommendation. I've seen plenty of people break the law, but I've never seen anyone break physics. Anything within the laws of physics is possible. Yeah. I mean, and you can certainly challenge the laws of physics, but uh, they've been challenged quite well and uh, have found to be resilient. We focus on, on signal over noise. Um, a lot of companies get, get confused. They, they spend money on things that don't actually make the product better. For example, at, at Tesla, we've, we've never spent any money on advertising. Um, we, we put all of the money into R&D and, and manufacturing and design to try to make the car as good as possible. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's the way to go. For, for any given company, just can, can keep thinking about, are these efforts that p people are, are expending, are they resulting in a better product or service? And if they're not, stop those efforts. It's hard to say because things have worked out pretty well in the end. So how, how big of a mistake could it have been? As the, as the question is really, really asking. Um, uh, you know, I did lots of dumb things at my first company and at PayPal, um, and uh, you know, I, I think I think sometimes, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. There, there's so many. I like I'm hard pressed to say this is this is the biggest one. You know. Give us one or two. Okay. <laughs> um, Personal oh, okay, sure. Um, so, th th there, th th the biggest mistake in general that I've made and I'm trying to correct for that is uh, to put too much of a weighting on somebody's talent and not enough on their personality. Um, and I've made that mistake several times. In fact, I, then I'd say, oh, gee, I'm not going to make that mistake again, then I would make it again. Um, and, and I think it, it actually matters uh, whether somebody has a good heart. It really does. And, and I've, made the, I've made the mistake of thinking that sometimes it's just about the brain. What were your biggest obstacles or mistakes that you have faced and how did you overcome it? And maybe you can also give us, the students here, a piece of advice and that will be very amazing. Thank you. Well, 
Well, to be frank, I've made so many mistakes that it would take far too long for me to list them all. Um, so I, I would not want to bore people with the, ex the extremely long list of mistakes that I've made in the past. Um, but I think that the, the, the higher principle here is that uh, it is always to aspire to be less wrong over time. So to acknowledge that you will always be to some degree wrong, but that you wish to be less wrong over time. And, and, uh, and if you can be a little less wrong every day, I think you're doing great. Um, it's, it's hard to be less wrong every day, but frankly, even if you could be less wrong most days, that, that's a pretty big victory. Um, you know, a, a number of things that I've said, I've said before publicly, so um, you know, I think it's important to, to place weight upon both the heart and the mind, not simply the mind. Um, some of the biggest mistakes that I've made in terms of hiring people have been when they were strong of mind but not of heart. The higher high principle is just assume you're wrong and you want to be less wrong and just try to be less wrong every day. Um, seek critical feedback, especially from friends. Um, often your friends will know what, what, you're, what, what you're saying is wrong, but they don't want to hurt your feelings, so they won't tell you. But if you ask them to tell you and say that it won't hurt your feelings, then they will tell you. So I think getting critical feedback from friends is very helpful. Now is the time to take risk. You don't have kids. As you get older, your obligations increase. So you, the, and once you have a family, you start taking risk not just for yourself, but for your family as well. It gets much harder to uh, do things that might not work out. Um, so now is the time to do that uh, before, you, before you have those obligations. So I would, I would encourage you to take risks now. Do something bold. Um, you won't regret it. I would say tr try to learn as much, as much as possible that allows you to predict the future or make the future. So the saying is the best way to predict the future is to make it. Um, just, and, and then assess whether what you're learning is enabling you to predict the future with less error. Are you less wrong? We're all, always wrong to some degree. But can you reduce the error on your future predictions? I think that's the way to look at education. As we, of course, but it's both creative, create the future, and predict the future. So that includes art and all those other things. But close the loop on being less wrong about future. I would say that's the right way to think about education. I mean, down the road with a neural link, it w you can just upload any subject instantly. So it'd be like the Matrix. You want to fly a helicopter, no problem. Well, helicopters will fly themselves, but you know, if you wanted to do whatever, any any given skill, you just upload it instantly. Um, I mean, the way education works right now, it's extremely low bandwidth. It's extremely slow. <sighs> Lectures are the worst, really. It's like very slow. Yeah. Um, Yeah, just <laughs> try to predict the future with less error. This is the hard. This is very hard, as you were saying. I'm not sure it's 99.9%, .9%, but it's it's not very good generally. Our prediction of the future, but I think often people don't try. The first thing is try. If you don't try, okay, you know, got to, you got to try, and then yeah. and then adjust based on the error of your prior predictions. How did you figure? you were going to start a car company and be successful at it. Well, I, I didn't really think Tesla would be successful. I thought we would most likely fail. But I thought that we at least uh, could address the false perception that people had that an electric car had to be ugly and slow and, and boring like a golf cart. But you say you didn't expect the company to be successful? Then why try? If something's important enough, you should try, even if you, the probable outcome is failure. I was, uh, I was always kind of like a crazy kid, I suppose. Um, I was just very curious about the world and um, how do we come to be here, what's the meaning of life and all that. And uh, um, I always had a really in intense desire to understand things and learn. Um, yeah, I mean, I had sort of an existential crisis, well, I guess, when I was I don't know, 11 or 12 or something, trying to figure out what it's all about, you know. and. Uh, Ultimately, came to, came to the conclusion that um, we don't really know the answer, but uh, 
But if we increase the scope and scale of civilization, then we uh, we have a much better chance of understanding the meaning of life and why, why we're here or even what are the right questions to ask. So therefore, we should strive to expand the scope and scale of consciousness to better understand the questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. Where do you go to, both personally, um, intellectually, as an engineer, as a team, like for source of strength needed to sort of persevere through this and to uh, keep going with the project, take it to completion? A source of strength. Hmm. I, I just really not how I think about things. Um, I mean, for me, it's simply this this is something that is important to get done. Um, and we, we should just keep doing it. Um, or die trying, and I, I don't need a source of strength. So quitting is not even like. Um, that's not. It's not in my nature. Okay. And I, I don't care about optimism or pessimism. That we're gonna get it done. Okay. interview someone to work at the companies would be to ask them to tell me about the problems that they worked on and how they solved them. And if, if someone was really the, the person that solved it, they'll be able to answer multiple levels. They'll be able to go down to the brass tacks. And if they weren't, they'll get stuck. And then you can say, oh, this person was not really the person who solved it, because anyone who struggled hard with a problem never forgets it. Why do we need to build a city on Mars with a million people on it? in your lifetime, which I, th I think is kind of what you've said you'd love to do. Yeah, I think it's important to have um, a future that is inspiring and appealing. I mean, I, I just think that there, like, there have to be reasons that you get up in the morning and you want to live. Like, why do you want to live? What, what's the point? What, what inspires you? What, what do you love about the future? And if, if we're not out there, if the future does not include being out there among the stars, uh, and being a multi-planet species, I find that, in, that it's incredibly depressing if that's not the future that we're going to have. I think the, the, the value of beauty and inspiration is, is very much underrated, no question. Um, but I want to be clear, I, like, I'm not trying to be anyone's savior. Uh, that is not the... I, I'm just trying to think about the future and not be sad. I think I'm kind of constitutionally just geared to, to just keep going. I don't know. Um, it's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it just, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it certainly, it, there are times when you know, things don't go well, and then uh, that's quite dispiriting, for sure. Um, and so then it's, it's difficult to proceed with the same level of enthusiasm. Um, but, um, but I do think, like, I do think the things that we're doing are, are you know, are pretty important to the future, um, and if we don't succeed, then, you know, there's, well, there's, there's not, it's not clear what other things would succeed, um, and if, if we don't succeed, then we will be certainly pointed to as a reason why people shouldn't even try for these things. So, uh, I think it's important that we do whatever is necessary to keep going. If you're trying to convince the public to do something, you have to say, okay, how's this going to read? Um, and w what message are we going to try to convey? Um, what will people respond to? What would I respond to if I was, you know, sort of an objective member of the public? And um, so that's that, that's really, you know, if, if you're trying to change people's minds or get people fired up about something, um, then you got to think, okay, what, what's that message? What what's going to get them really excited? The reason I got into space was to try to increase NASA's budget. <laughs> well, God bless you. Then. <laughs> But so I'll tell you, so the roundabout way I thought we, that might be accomplished was 
um, I thought, well, if, if NASA's budget was, more, was larger, then we could do more in space exploration. And I thought, well, what, what, particularly if we could get the public excited about sending people to Mars. And I thought, well, if, if I could do a small greenhouse and, and send that to the surface of Mars with seeds yes. in, mm -hmm. in um, nutrient gel, and you hydrate the gel on landing, right. you have a little miniature greenhouse, and then you'd, you'd have, uh, the public tends to get excited about precedents and superlatives. So it would be like the, you know, sort of first life on Mars, the furthest life's ever traveled, and, and you get people sort of excited about, well, but we should send people there, like the hell with plants, we should send people, you know. Right, right. Um, and, um, and then um, I thought, well, that could, if, if that could get the public really excited about sending people to Mars, then that would translate into congressional support for a bigger NASA budget. That was the goal. Um, and then I, I didn't have enough money to buy, uh, and I, I thought that that outcome would have a 100% chance of no, no, no commercial success. <laughs> so, so the 100% chance of, of losing all the money. So, um, so compared to that, SpaceX, which I thought maybe had a 10% chance of success, that was an improvement. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Jeff Bezos, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. I think we saw it in the internet world quite a bit where, you know, at the sort of peak of the internet in say 1999, found people